Good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to call to order Thursday, August 30th, full board. First order of business is Pledge of Allegiance. Please rise. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Invocation by Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let's bow our heads. Lord, please guide us as we deliberate on behalf of the residents of Macomb County. Please guide us to always do right and just for the residents of Macomb County. Please give us the intestinal fortitude to make the right decision and not the popular decision. Lord, please guide this county and keep your blessings upon all. Amen. Thank you. Moving to item number four, adoption of the agenda. I need a motion to adopt. Moved by Commissioner Romano, supported by Commissioner Myjack. Uh, all in, uh, please vote. Vote for me. I vote yes on this. And is this going to work for me also, Mike? All right, motion uh, to adopt has passed. Uh, what are we at? Um, 11, 12, 11 to zero? 11 to zero. Uh, item number five, approval of minutes dated August 16, 2018. I need a motion to approve. Commissioner so Drolet, supported by Commissioner Carabelli. No discussion, please vote. Motion passes 11 to 0. Item number 6, public participation. Any members of the public wishing to speak? You have five minutes. Any members of the public wishing to speak? Third and final time on the first public participation. So we're closing that. Go to item number 7, correspondence for the Office of County Executive. Um, I guess Steve's going to handle that in a little while. <laughs> uh, so none other than the uh, budget presentation. So we're going to close item number 7 and go to item number 8. Presentations. Uh, Steve, proposed capital improvement plan 2019 to 2023. Uh, would you like to? Good see afternoon, us off? Commissioners. Good to be here. Good again. afternoon. Um, so I. Yes. Uh, all you, the, you have the. All the documents are in your binders, yeah. Commissioners. So you have the five-year capital plan for 2019 through 2023, and as I have in past years kind of keep today's comments um, brief, answer any questions I can, and um, certainly we'll have um, Ms. Bricks and Mr. Uh, Van Blurk back in future meetings to talk more specifically about individual projects. So my comments would be more high level in terms of total dollars and funding for those projects. So you'll see on page one, you have a list of facilities uh, projects uh, there's 31 of them. Uh, the 31st one is actually an emergency management project. The, the remainder of them are uh, facilities and operations. You'll see on here that there's a lot of um, heating and cooling system replacements, rooftop units. Where you, uh, I just want to make sure where you're at, Steve. I don't know. I don't have the full agenda with me, so it's the first, it's the first uh, page of data. The last tab under yeah. capital plan? Okay. Oh, no, it's actually. I no, it's for us. I'm sorry, but oh, for okay. us, it's the last tab. All right. Under capital plan, and here we go. Everybody find it? <clears throat> okay. Great. Okay. Thank you. So you'll see we have a lot of uh, projects on here. A number of them, again, are heating and cooling related at various buildings. We have a, a number, quite a few um, older units in various buildings throughout the county. So we've identified. Uh, just about $39 million in projects um, over the next five years, 29 million of those uh, in the F&O area, about 10 million in um, IT related projects, which are uh, listed individually on the following page. Um, those have been uh, identified by year uh, for the next five years. And toward the bottom of page one, you will see um, a uh, list of funding sources for those projects. And the, um, the highlight here is that for 2019, 
we're projecting about a $13 million contribution from the capital plan or from the general fund to the capital plan and you'll see in the outgoing years about 9.6 million in 2020, another 8 million, three in 2021. And then it dwindles down for the last couple of years because we're not you know, sure what we've identified or haven't identified that far out yet for certain things. Um, I guess the other thing I would like to highlight here is that primarily because of growth in property tax revenues and uh, PPT reimbursements, uh, there is no longer a need to bond for these projects for the next five years. I'll go over that uh, later on in the presentation in terms of our debt profile uh, with the cr uh, rating agencies, but very good news in the sense that we, at this point, don't have a need to issue any more debt to fund these uh, projects in the uh, next five years. We do have a, a drawdown of fund balance in the next couple of years, but I think it's sustainable and will get us and you know keep our rating at that level but um, just want to highlight that again page two a list of all the IT related things there's a lot of infrastructure uh, needs that have been identified by the IT department as well as other system replacements and or upgrades in various departments and our intention is to have the department heads requesting these upgrades uh, come before you in whatever format the board wishes, either at their budget hearing or in a separate meeting or something, so the department heads can speak to the board uh, more intelligently as to why these systems are upgrades or their uh, requests are needed. Uh, and again, at the bottom of page two, a, a summary of the IT projects by department. And again, you'll, you'll see that out of the 9.9 .9 million, about 6 million is actually in IT, which is most, you know, a lot of that's infrastructure related types of things. And uh, I guess th that's the, the uh, extent of my comments today until we talk about individual projects uh, as we go through budget hearings. But certainly <coughs> happy to answer any questions that I can at this point. Great. <clears throat> um, Commissioner Brown. Thank you. The uh, projects listed on the description on the uh, first page, are those in those are the order of the priority of the projects, or they just happen to be? No, a lot of those are in the same order. Kind of prioritize them by year. Okay. So first the year in, that first they've out. been identified kind of sets the priority. This is sort of in, uh, at one point in time it was intended to be alphabetical, but it's not necessarily alphabetical anymore. So those are the order, those are the priorities. Well, we prioritize them by year, so you'll see all the projects identified for 2019. I guess I'm, I'm asking, Steve, is we got them listed 1, 2, 31. Does that mean anything, or is that just how many no, projects? No, it's just the there? number of projects. All right, that's what I'm It's just okay. a simple numerical count. I got you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <coughs> first, I'd like to commend the board chair and finance in the executive's office uh, and the finance chair, we had the opportunity to sit down and go through this capital plan before it was presented to the board to kind of give us an, an update of where they were going. So the good news is, is that property taxes and the P um, uh, PPT reimbursement is gonna save us from not going out for bond. Bad news is, is that we're still spending a little bit more than what we planned on taking in and that doesn't make me warm and fuzzy. With that said, <coughs> There was conversation, I guess it, uh, it'd be now for anybody to let the board chair know that if you would like, to, how you would like to have these IT projects, which is just under $10 million in 2019 broken out. I personally, after discussion, didn't feel it was fair for Jayco to try to present on behalf of all these departments without knowing their um, needs. His is the <coughs> implementation part of it. So, I, and I don't think it's fair to Jayco to come to every um, budget hearing for each individual apartment uh, department so I'd like to hash out now before we go on what is the pleasure of the board of how because there's gonna be a lot of questions and it's and again I don't think it's fair to Jayco or Steve who don't know what these individual departments needs are All right uh, Steve we talked about this and we talked about it with everybody that you know Jayco although he has to be here for the IT projects the fact that some of them might be in uh, you know all different departments and he can't answer all the questions we kind of get in that pro that problem where you know, both of them need to be there for the IT section I of it. I would agree. And, and we, I would agree. So, but since they're department heads, uh, I know that we talked to Mark Delden and, and you about 
how how do I mean how how does it work out best? Does he come to these meetings and we try to get them um, that part of the meeting in first, or do we have a separate meeting in just a day or two on only IT items and bring all the department heads in? I haven't heard back from the executive's office on this, but it is something where I mean we can't have Jayco here every you know every uh, budget presentation. Every budget because, hearing, I right. No. But however, I mean, there's be, about uh, well, was there eight or nine different departments on sure. here? Um, so there'd be eight or nine different meetings. Um, I haven't had that follow-up conversation with the exec's office either. So I'll follow, yeah. I'll follow up with Mark okay. and Mark Delden and, and sure. get so back to you in yeah, short it, order. At the end of the day, I mean, we're going to be here for all these meetings anyway. So if right. he has to, if he wants to come to every meeting, that's fine. Or, and I don't think that we would have a problem setting up a special meeting or designating a part of a different um, uh, department's. Delegate, you know, designated space and then kind of bringing everybody right. through or six in one day six right. and, I mean however it works but well I think we need to work it out I also think as every I believe everybody agrees it's important for the departments to be here to talk about their Both. projects yes. because right because we yeah, saw what I, happened I, I'm not an expert yeah. in the health department or whatever sure so, so if you can um, uh, and I will advance that with uh, Mark also that we need to yeah. get some kind of a plan in, in place however it works best because we don't doesn't matter to us. We're going to hear it, whether it's a bunch of different times or all at once. Right. So. Exactly. All right. Yeah. Anything absolutely. else, Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I <coughs> guess, and at this time, I'd like to also put on the table. I'm personally, as one commissioner, not warm and fuzzy of approving ten million dollars of IT, no matter what the projects are, because that's not my forte of my professional. Uh, it's not what I do, and I'm not uh, saying that anybody's doing anything wrong. But for us to approve a project after they made a business case, I don't know what a switch is, and I don't know what half this stuff is. And I'd like to have some sort of check and balance, and I don't know if it's hiring a, a, a consultant or what it may be. I'm not comfortable approving $10 million a project not knowing IT personally. I need some direction for a check and balance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Romano. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, first off, I, I agree entirely with Commissioner Carabelli. Um, second thing I have is, if I may, uh, Mr. Schmiegel, can you give me an approximate balance that our fund our fund balance would be at the end of 2019 and the percentage that that amount would be in regards to before our bond uh, costs would go up? Mm -hmm. So I need an approximate balance of what our 2019 general fund balance would be and what would that be a percentage of that would cause us to have our uh, bond interest go up? Well, what we're projecting at this point in time is at the end of 2019, if everything, of course, plays right. out the way we projected, that Without the fund the, balance uh, would be about 21, just shy of 21% of expenses. And that's a uh, slide 21 on my PowerPoint in the next presentation. Okay, so normally the bond companies like you to maintain X number of dollars in your general fund, and if you don't, actually the juice goes up. And is there a, a dollar amount that you know of, of this 21% that we should be maintaining? Uh, they usually look at percentage of total expenses, more so than the actual dollars themselves. So it will cover that later on because they also look at the general fund in combination with the delinquent tax revolving fund in terms of total fund balance. Thank you. That's so all I have, Chair. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Brown. <clears throat> Thank you. Getting back to Commissioner Carbelli's comments regarding uh, the, the idea that possibly we need to hire someone to review the IT department we'll go over the shoulder of the person that we hired to do the job for us I'm, I'm not sure that's the right way to go about things I mean they we hire them they were there but they're our employees <laughs> we, we have confidence in what they do I mean if we're gonna do that then we've got to we're gonna have it sets a bad precedent because if we're gonna if we do that for that department then everything else that we do Things we don't trust the department that's bringing the recommendations for us. We don't think they're looking out. I mean, I don't know if that's so. I'm not comfortable necessarily doing that just yet. I mean, we're going to have them review the projects and then we're going to evaluate them individually. It was a good suggestion rather than having Jayco come here. Let's have the departments that are talked about and that, that made sense. And it was, seems reasonable to us. We got to go forward with it because we have people on staff that we hired. <coughs> no, we didn't directly <coughs> hire, but. So it's, they, they work for us. They're part of our organization. I think it's doesn't do a lot for the organization's morale to be uh, hiring people, and bad for the taxpayers, quite frankly, too. If we got to be 
having a shadow government set up to monitor things. So just my thought, I'm, my opening thoughts. I'm not saying I wouldn't be against it. I'm just, just saying maybe, we, maybe that's going down the wrong road. Thank you. So I don't have anybody else on the first round except for myself, so I'm going to jump in and ask a few questions, and also maybe I can clarify this. I know Commissioner Carabelli several times has discussed um, uh, basically uh, a study, so to speak, like on – IT and, and where it should be going um, and, and different we've done that we've done studies before but since IT is such a fast pace um, you know industry and w it, that we've done it before and we had a five-year plan brought you know that we've hired an outside company for just to kind of give guidance and, and make sure that we're going so I'm pretty sure that you're talking more about uh, doing that what you've mentioned a bunch of times before I know to, to executive Delden um, and even when Jaco was here about the IT plan that we've had before, that he would like to carry that on and do that again because that plan has reached its uh, expiration date. So I'm going to I'm speaking for you. If you want to speak again after, obviously Jim, that's fine. Um, you you want to just you want to finish up on that, or did you, was go ahead. Real quick, and uh, Chair Smith uh, hit it on the head. We hired Plant and Moran. They did a five-year study, and we received that ten years ago. And when I was chair of infrastructure, we followed that five-year plan, and when things came up, it was in that five-year plan with things changing. And since then, we've changed department heads. Since then, five years ago, technology has completely changed. So that 10-year-old that plan that was only good for five years was 10 years ago. And like I said, and like I was saying to hire professional, because I am, I am not that smart to know if it's right or wrong, and I'm not saying anything about trust, it's about doing right by the tax dollars. We hire professionals to do audits. I'm not saying Steve doesn't do his job. We hire professionals, architects, to look at jail beds to see what they want to do, and sometimes we question things. So the reality is, is we hire professionals all the time, but it's not our forte. All I'm saying, $10 million is a lot of money to me. And being that we're spending $10 million of taxpayers' dollar, and I don't know enough about it, it's not a mistrust thing, it's to ensure that we're doing the right thing for the county as a whole, and we've done it in the past. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, on the first round, still, Commissioner Drolat, I'll let you hit it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think I understand both points have been made here, uh, and there's a line somewhere. It's clearly, we want to have outside auditors come and do auditing. We want to have outside experts help us with our financial responsibilities. At the same time, I don't know much about building roads. Do I need a, somebody to hire the board to oversee our road department uh, because? We don't know exactly what's going on with the roads. Do I, I don't know, you know a lot of the details about uh, water and sewer projects. Do we need someone looking over Candace Miller's you know, shoulder as our expert you know, to make sure that we're getting all the information? Or do we have, as, as Commissioner Brown said, uh, you know, Commissioner Miller and uh, IT experts and so forth for that expertise? That's why they've been hired to explain those things to us. So I understand both points. I know there's a line somewhere, but uh, it, we, we simply can't hire uh, our own independent expert to oversee every single thing we do. It's just not feasible. All right. Again, I'm going to just run this out there again, that I don't think anybody is saying that we hire someone to oversee. They're hiring. We're, we're looking at maybe a, a long-term plan from a different, you know, a different perspective to make sure that um, – Maybe you know we like where, where we're going. I'm not I'm not advocating or not advocating, but I know Commissioner Carabelli didn't say hire someone to oversee our IT department. Uh, so I apologize if I mis that, if I mischaracterized it. Yeah. That that being said, man, I have some real questions for you. But uh, Commissioner uh, Brown on the second round. Present <laughs> Let that director of IT come up and presented a five-year plan for us and to see where that goes because our plan might not be consistent with his plan and he we could spend all the money in the world but if he goes well guess what I got a different philosophy and and it may be valid too there's two ways to get to one point and if we got a different way then we spent money on nothing because he's going to do his own thing with the backing of the executive so well at, at I mean, the at the end of the day I don't, I don't want to cut you off but we're not debating whether we're going to do this right now and if it comes up in a in a motion at some point we'll have a chance we're to debate a that. discussion and i'm you know, no, I know and, and, and i respect i respect what he's talking about because right. you're right i mean because of wise because because of Car Jim carabelli's wise decision about looking at that jail thing we saved a lot of money and that's that's all the and kudos him for doing that in time so uh, I appreciate that. So, Mr. Chairman, point of information, real quick, and I won't continue. Go ahead. If I may. 
I, I heard the commissioners, and I don't disagree with what they're saying. I agree with them. But with that said, it's not us really commissioning it. It was the executive office IT that commissioned that study from Plant and Moran 10 yes. years ago. Yeah. I think it needs to happen again. I don't know the direction of where we're going. And when we bring up about building roads, there's specifications on how we have to build roads from the state. And when we talk about drains, there's specification on how things have to be done. We have no specification on IT. We don't have to have IT. And we just did a long-term road plan on roads and their, their gradings and stuff like yes. that, what need to happen. Thank we you. did that internally. Commissioner Romano. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just on the second round, round, let me give you an example of maybe perhaps what Mr. Caravelli is mentioning. Uh, ramp pole access solution looks like $1,500. I don't have a clue. Does anybody know what that is? So my point is maybe if we get Jack O'Hare, he can bring this down to English for us. I, I know he understands it, and, and perhaps Schmeagel understands it, Mr. Schmeagel, but I don't understand it. I'd like to know what that is, and what am I spending that for? And when we went to that jail solution thing, it was down to nuts and bolts so that we understood exactly what they wanted and what they wanted to perform with, and that's how Mr. Carabelli came up with his idea. So I don't particularly think maybe we don't need an outside source to come in here and look this over. Maybe we just need Jocko in here to explain exactly, without all this, uh, like I said, half of these things, I don't even know what they're talking about. And I'd like to know what they are, that's all. I'd just like to know what they are if I'm gonna have to okay spending for them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Seeing no other commissioners on the first or second round. Steve, I have a couple questions for you. Um, <clears throat> let me get back to the capital projects. Um, were, were all of the capital projects that were requested included or no okay um and then well then how uh, can you just and, and i mean maybe this is for you can just come back to it but how were they prioritized like what made the list and what didn't make the list and and how i mean was it just based on different departments and how they rated they ranked their their to needs degree, that's true that's true we we i can't remember there's a fair number on there of um items that seem to be not as critical, I guess, at this point in time. So we removed those from the list. We're in the process now of arranging meetings with those departments to get a better understanding of, you know, the need, okay. so to speak. So <clears throat> I guess this is my question because all of the 31 that are on here are um, costed out through 2023. Um, but it doesn't mean that the ones that didn't make the list won't keep coming back and, and becoming more and more, um, um, I, I guess, a higher priority, right? I mean, unless unless you unless that some of them, it's possible. Most of those were IT related system relate, you know, system replacements, upgrades. Most of the ones that didn't most make the, it. Most of the ones that didn't make the list. Right, but so then you can uh, you can probably see that the system upgrades are sooner or later going to be uh, almost possibly uh, needed. Right? Okay. Possibly, I mean, some of them were longer term out f in the future. Okay. Again, maybe can we hold off, hold off, but this is in the next five years, we mm. see this happening. This is what you, I mean, so out of all of them, even the ones that you yeah. didn't show us, you said these can yeah, wait. Yeah, trying to get a better understanding from yeah. the departments, trying to see if there's a different solution, because again, we weren't necessarily involved in my office in the discussions with IT, for the most part, with the departments. Got it. So we're trying to get a better understanding ourselves. Okay. All right, thank you. <coughs> Commissioner Toko. Um, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Thank you, Chair. Um, we know that that group of contracts that we voted on before, most of those were um, renewals of existing contracts that came from the former administrator in IT, um, that they, the, the original projects initiated with the former administrator. And I don't know how we get to this, but what we don't know is we don't know if there are newer, more innovative companies out there that um, other counties are using across the nation. Um, we don't know if we're being, if we're stagnant in some areas compared to others or if we're doing absolutely great. Um, that doesn't mean one way or another in, in judgment. We just don't know. And, I know less about technology than Commissioner Caravelli, so thank you. <laughs> Great, and I think one of the things we did about that was when those 
those contracts came in uh, from IT, we changed them from four year to a year and a half so we could mm -hmm. actually get um, diff you know, uh, uh, RFPs or RFQs out uh, you know, next year so we could actually address that problem. And I think maybe you might be getting at wanting to do that you know, on a more regular basis, it sounds like, but wherever, uh, wherever you're going with that. I know that we are looking at addressing that because of that concern. Right. Um, so thank you. I don't have anyone else <coughs> on the list. So, Steve, if you'd like to, um, are we done with? Um, yeah, that's my that's kind of my comments on 8A? the capital plan. The, the Great. So, with no other questions, I need a motion to receive and file 8A, the pro proposed capital improvement plan for 2019 through 2013. So Commissioner Leonetti, supported by Commissioner Toko. Please vote. <coughs> Motion passes 12 to 0. Item 8B, 2019 Executive Recommended County Budget. Steve. Okay. Um, I'll skip page one because that's just the uh, cover sheet. So uh, slide two, uh, kind of an overall view of the 2019 budget. Um, as you can see, the uh, budget across all funds is about $769 million. It's about a $48 million increase over the amended 18. You'll see later... Um, a lot of that has to do with capital projects that are not currently in the 2018 budget. Um, the increase in the general fund is about $23.9 million. Again, a lot of that increase is being driven by the inclusion of $13 million of general fund contribution to the capital improvement fund, as well as some one-time increases in uh, equipment and such uh, at the Sheriff's Department, which we'll talk about that, <coughs> as well as... Um, new positions and we'll talk about that and uh, some other uh, increases in general operating costs which we'll talk about that as well in five or six slides maybe seven slides a uh, large ex increase in expenditures in the department of roads of about 33 million dollars increased road funding increased projects uh, also driving uh, a need for three additional positions in the road department we've talked many times recently about the new indigent defense fund where the accounting and all the uh, transactions related to the pro uh, providing indigent defense are now in their own fund and we're getting some additional state uh, funding for that program. Uh, so that's a new fund. I'm just highlighting that, uh, that it's a $6 million uh, fund. It's new. It's about an additional uh, $2.8 million, I want to say, from the state in terms of additional costs under the new uh, parameters of indigent defense. Uh, there's a large decrease in the uh, budget of the debt service fund. There's not a big decrease in the total debt service requirements. What's changing is the accounting for the intermediate trust fund and the debt service on those bonds. And so uh, we talked a little bit about this yesterday where the assets in that fund are not necessarily considered trust assets for OPEB accounting purposes and the funding. And I think Commissioner Kleinfeld may have brought that up yesterday. <coughs> so um, generally accepted accounting principles for government require those assets now to be accounted for in a governmental fund, as we call it. So not a trust fund. Um, so it's being accounted for in a new internal service fund. Internal service funds are accounted for, I'm going to try not to get too much into the weeds, but on the full accrual basis of accounting. So the debt service payments are not coming out of the debt service fund anymore. They're coming out of this new internal service fund. And they're not even recorded as expenses. They're just recorded as a direct reduction of the liability. So and it may seem confusing on its surface, but um, again, we'll cover debt service requirements later on in the presentation. There's no re real reduction in debt service requirements, just the accounting for the intermediate trust and the debt service payments on the retiree health care bonds. <coughs> again, the budget for the general fund is about or $46 million, excuse me. Uh, again, an increase of about twenty-nine or $22.9 million. Um, we'll talk about uh, the general fund more in detail. 
in a few slides, as I mentioned previously, we're uh, adding a total of 35.5 uh, FTEs to the budget uh, and a net cost of a, just shy of a million and a half uh, to the general fund. Again, I, uh, I got a schedule on that uh, in just a couple of slides. Uh, five of those positions were added because of the new judge. We've known about that for a couple of years. Uh, that's about four hundred and fifty thousand dollars, or four thirty-eight. Um, we're adding or recommending that we add sixteen positions in the sheriff department to relieve overtime. This may seem this is a significant increase or significant ask. So <clears throat> there's actually a first-year cost to the county of doing this because when you bring a new deputy on board, uh, they go to the academy for three months, then they're in a field training program for three months, and by the time they get up to full speed and become part of the complement, and then Sheriff Wickersham, I'm sure we'll uh, uh, talk about this in more detail when you have his budget hearing. Um, it's about nine months before you start feeling the full effect of the uh, relief of overtime. So those 16 positions are three deputies and three corrections deputies. Corrections deputies are in the complement a little bit quicker because the academy's not so long and the field training is internal or you know, inside the jail. But um, you start seeing, again, relief in overtime in about nine months. You see relief on its full effect in year two. As you'll see that there's really not a lot of huge dollar savings here. It's about pretty much a wash. Um, when you factor in the new benefit structure and so on and so forth, <clears throat> what's important to understand is that somewhere in the neighborhood of 45% of the overtime at the Sheriff's Department is forced overtime. So for people are being ordered over every day. And a lot of those order overs are from midnights on the day shift. And so you have um, tired folks, tired employees, morale is low, people are stressed out, so on and so forth. So the idea is from a liability perspective, you hire folks and Commissioner Sauger, I'm sure can you know attest to this, you, you're reducing the exposure and the liability of the county for uh, someone doing something you know off the cuff or reactionary and then we end up with a lawsuit or something of, of that nature. So that's the reason for the 16 positions there. The remaining 14 positions you'll see in a, a the next slide or two are, are um, spread across multiple departments. Three of them are at the roads, um, and that's about $169,000 annual cost to the general fund. Kind of three other significant things that I, I like to highlight every year. We are projecting a 3.5% increase in property taxes. We're, it, we know we're going to experience about a 3.5% increase this year. We budgeted two. Our forecast a year ago had also budgeted two for 2019. We're now projecting three and a half. Um, every percent increase in property tax revenue is about $1.2 million. So that's about $1.8 million for this year. That rolls forward every year for, you know, a number of, well, basically forever until we have, a, if we have a downturn or something of that nature. But anyway, um, the other $1.8 million in 19 then rolls forward every year too. So it, that's where we get into uh, significant increases in uh, revenues that are able to fund some of these capital projects. <clears throat> um, all of our collective bargaining agreements include a 1% across the board wage increase uh, for 2019. Um, nothing has built, built into this regarding the compensation study at this point in time, so that I'm sure was going to be a question coming up later on. Um, we're still in the process of studying that and trying to, you know, see what is possible or not possible. Uh, again, we build a 4% uh, health care uh, escalator in every year, and again, the last bullet on the page is based on our current forecasts. We won't need to bond for any capital projects, which is very, very good news. <clears throat> we'll go on to page three. Here's the list of the positions. So what I've tried to highlight here are the new positions for the new judge in red, just to kind of make it. Yeah, and that's fine. If you want to put on the, uh, did you put it in, Don? 
Okay. Uh, can we stop so we get to sure. questions that are kind of timely? If anyone has one on any sure. particular topic, let me know. Uh, I know you're on here too, Veronica. Uh, Commissioner Brown. Thank you. Um, what's the percentage increase from this year's budget, proposed budget, to last year's budget? Uh, let me see. There's a 6.7%. Uh, That's two slides from now. Across all funds. What was it last year? It's like I it don't know. Flat. I don't. I don't know. I'd have to get back with you on that. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Do we have a copy of these slides in here? We do not yet. Uh, it would be a lot easier. I'm looking for Mike. I put it in the uh, civic clerk this afternoon. It was. It was okay. intended to be. They on had your everything printed up by the time they got in there. So yeah, if we Mike, have it, we'll Mike indicated to me that they were going to be on your uh, iPad. They are on the. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Mm. It's on the iPad. I'd like a physical copy. We, yeah, we'll, we'll get those. We, they you. weren't, by the time that we printed up everything for the meeting, they hadn't okay. seen them yet. Because, so. you know, like what happened yesterday, the um, the iPad had different page numbers than what I, yep. the original packet, than what was in front of me physically. So Got thank it. you. Um, Commissioner Drolette. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And just a clarification on uh, Commissioner Brown's point. I'm looking at the, the general fund main page, I guess, in the, in the, uh, the binder that we're given, and, and it states the 2019 general fund expenditure budget totals 246 million, essentially, an increase of 10.2%. So is it six point something? 6.7 across in all funds. 10% in the general fund, 6.7. That's, I thought, would. Okay. I thought that's what you did, Commissioner Brown's I question may, was. I may have misunderstood that then, but the, okay. The entire so. budget is 6.7%. I see. Okay. So, uh, and then there was a revenue increase of about 5.2% uh, based on this page, and inflation was 2.1%. So I realize that 10.2% increase is distorted because, to some degree because last year we really didn't approve the capital projects fund as part of the budget, mm -hmm. and this is requesting that, so that takes up a piece of that increase. And then, of course, uh, you know, I, I, I assume that some of the new road funding revenue uh, really didn't flow in to the full year's budget until this year as opposed to last year. Some will flow in next year. Some will flow in uh, next year. And I can't remember. I'm sure they're using some fund balance. Right, Since right. I'm sure. I suspect that they are using some fund balance. So I, I, I wonder if it's possible then to pull out uh, the capital fund out of the budget and pull out uh, the roads because that's, you know, impacted by the revenues coming from the state at some point, and give us a, an increase that of, of of what the budget is increased without those two other those two out those two factors. You don't have to do it yeah, now. That's fine. I can do that. Okay, that would be greatly appreciated. $21 million of fund balance in 2019. So of their, you know, their increase in expenses was $32 million. So 21 is going to, you know, they're drawing down fund balance. Well, I, w I guess I was thinking that the state had uh, changed the uh, gas taxes, the, cha the state had changed the... Uh, yeah, and that's flowing through a little bit in a year, every year for the next two or three years. Okay. Yeah. So the roads uh, is not the increase in roads is not just because of that increase in revenue. It also right. came from There's fund balance. Down fund balance as well. I see. Okay, <clears throat> I guess I, I guess I'd be uh, want to look at what our general fund increases in spending without the capital projects included from last year to this year, if, if they didn't exist. I suppose just to look at just that, right. uh, and uh, I guess excluding roads as well. If you can take the time at some point to look and, and see if you can calculate it out because. I know that 10.2% is distorted by those facts, and I want to have an idea what it is, given that inflation was 2.1% last year. I don't want to go back and tell people we voted for something that was 500% the rate of inflation. You know, I, I, I guess I would also then suggest that we add back the debt service fund because part of this 6.7 is a reduction of almost $20 million in debt service requirements. So I say we take out the roads, take out the capital improvements, add back the debt service. Because again, our debt service requirements didn't go down in terms of cash outlay. It's just in where which fund it's accounted for, and it's in a fund that's not included in the budget. All right. 
Well, Steve, I'm going to see if I can't make an appointment with you to sit down and go over this stuff because it's very important to me to know that we are. It is I'm not going to. I'm not going to sit here and say it's easy to understand and. Right. So you know, sometimes accounting. Uh, well, there's rules and counting changes to the yeah. fact that we take out the capital plan one year and now it's included in this particular proposal and therefore it looks different. And we're including that in the budget so that there's a recognition that we have a need for capital no, I, outlay. And I so totally understand that. I, I just want to make sure that we're, I want to look at what the actual increase in spending right. is outside of those mm -hmm. factors. Uh, so I'll, we'll get together. Thank yeah. you very much. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Sager. <coughs> Uh, Steve, that 4% increase in the health care, is that for the present employees and, and uh, retirees? Uh, in current employees only. Oh, current employees yeah. only? Okay. Yeah. Because that bonding issue took care of the retirees. Yeah, all the retiree health care expenses are paid out of a trust fund right. that's funded by the bond proceeds. Okay, that's, thank you. Uh, seeing uh, no other commissioners, Steve, I have a question. Since we just we just addressed this, um, the uh, we're we're very happy to hear, as Commissioner Kleinfeld uh, mentioned, that we didn't have the twenty million dollar uh, bond um, in this budget request. M my question is: I, I looked at last year's um, general fund balance, and you gave us um, you gave it to us with a chart that ha included uh, the delinquent tax fund and then totaled out. And, and you didn't do it this year, at least on any of the slides I've seen. Maybe that's coming. It's like the last slide. Oh, okay, fantastic. <coughs> um, my, I guess my question is just in a broad theory. Uh, I understand property taxes went up, um, so that helps, obviously. Um, but our budget's going up a little bit. But when I looked at last year's general fund balance, and I think, but cor correct me if I'm wrong, was the $20 million bond incorporated into the projected um, general fund balance? It was. So can you give me a big picture on why that was, I mean, our, our balance went down to 14.5 in 2020, and now it, you know, well, oh, that was a little far out. Oh, no, here we go. It, it, this year it doesn't see, I mean, this, the new one, it doesn't go down as far. So I guess in general, what's, what's changed? Is it the, uh, well, you got property taxes. So you got right. property taxes coming in at well, three. And I, I realize that's a big one. Is yeah, there anything else? Yeah, that's a big else? one. So you got a million and a half a year for, well, 10 years, mm -hmm. for example. This year, starting or next year, starting in 19, you've got another million eight for nine more years. We're projecting a 3% increase for 20, kind so of, that's another kind of like compounded 1.2, and you've got all this compounding going on. So over the course of 10 years, that's about 54 point some million dollars in additional property tax revenue. Okay. So uh, that's a big uh, increase there. Um, the personal property tax reimbursement Two years ago, it was eight million. This year, it's seven million. We're projecting six for 2019. We've been budgeting four, so okay. we've built an additional two million dollars into that particular line item. Uh, real estate transfer tax. We've put another million. We've been budgeting three. It's been consistently around four million. Uh, there's been uh, a, a change, I guess, if you want to call it that, in the types of investment vehicles the treasurer's office is investing in so we've budgeted 250 or 300 thousand dollars a year in interest revenue we're now received i think it was in 2018 we might have received 775 thousand or something it was significantly higher so we increased the budget to 600 or yeah 600 thousand so you've got a lot of revenue increases that are um, legitimate that we're flowing through for future years so that's driving a lot of increases of course, we have salary and benefit increases, and uh, you'll see when I talk about the general fund in more detail, um, we have some increases in IT costs. We also have uh, rolled in maintenance, recurring maintenance items, if you will. Remember, uh, from facilities mm -hmm. yep. and IT, that's about $3.5 million, which is in re reducing the amount that we need to transfer to the capital improvement plan. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of things going on. Right. So high level, a lot of revenue. Okay. You know. Great. Thank you, um, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Thank you, Chair. On the personal property tax, that section of the personal property tax that's captured growth. That uh, um, that's not how the governor characterizes it, but it's captured growth. 
Um, so it's separate from the rest of the personal property tax um, refund that goes back out to the, the counties and the communities. And then that's doled out. And it was originally that that would be doled out based on population, I believe, or per capita. And there's been a big argument over that because it shouldn't go out that way because the outer line communities would be getting next to nothing and community uh, counties like ours would get a significant amount. Your budgeting, is it based on the formula that benefits Macomb County as opposed, and I don't know if they've changed it yet, but I think they're going to. And then Colin feed in this a little bit. It's the current formula. Plus we know in the last couple of years, there's been more in the fund at the state level because the economy's good and use tax is up and all of those things. So we're getting not only the base calculation, but we're getting additional distribution from that fund. And so that's expected to, you know, continue for the next few years at least. Right, but you know they're talking about changing that formula so that the outlying counties get more money and that they don't look at it like revenue sharing right, and they don't we, do this, it per capita. Right. And this would be updated once we know about that change, once it takes effect, if it does take effect. All right, but you know that discussion's taking place. Yeah, but I'm not worried about the details. And the hit to details. Macomb County, I believe, would be probably be, I think it was two to three million dollars on that, I'm not sure. Yeah, and that would go down from six to three, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep an eye on that, yeah. thank you. Great seeing no more speakers. Steve, please continue. Okay, I will move on to slide number three, which is the list of the new positions that have been uh, built into the budget. Again, I've, I've highlighted in red the, the five new positions that are related to the uh, new judgeship that's uh, being added in 2019. At the very bottom under the Sheriff Department, I've highlighted the two items in blue uh, related to the 16 positions being added for overtime reduction, and then all the other positions I left in bl uh, black. And you can see, uh, you know, spread through various departments at really a fairly minimal cost to the general fund. You can see a lot of uh, outfined funding or reductions in expenses. Um, the first one, for example, the city of East Point's recently expressed interest in having the county take over animal control services for their unit. So we've built in an animal control officer, which is funded by revenue. Uh, the clerk's office, we're adding a cashier that's necessitated, as we'll speak about in their budget hearing, uh, upon the, the completion of the downtown project and the separation between vital records and the court section. The health department has six positions for a total cost of 14,000. Um, in the general fund, a lot of uh, switching and the changing around of expenses. Uh, juvenile court is asking for a probation officer funded by reductions in placement costs, uh, essentially in uh, the child care fund. Prosecuting attorney uh, <clears throat> asked for, well, more than one position. We have included uh, a computer maintenance clerk in the budget. Um, that's being driven primarily as a requirement or a reaction to a need for uh, more video being reviewed from body cameras. So as you'll remember, a couple of years ago, we added all you know, body cameras to all the deputies at the sheriff's department and other departments in our county are also adding body cameras. So as uh, cases come into the prosecutor's office, there's more need to have staff or a staff, more staff to review more video. Uh, uh, and I'll just stop there and uh, Prosecutor Smith, I'm sure can uh, elaborate much more intelligently on that than I can. Public Works, um, Commissioner Miller is doing a, a kind of a large scale reorganization. Um, at the end of the day, um, she's adding basically two part-time drain uh, laborers and uh, I can't remember which other position she's adding, but it, it nets out to a, a cost of about 36 million or $40 million. Uh, the roads are ask, asking for three positions. And again, the, the net cost of all of this um, is about a million and a half. Um, about 169,000 exclusive of the deputies and the corrections deputies and the new judges. So, 
the extent of my comments on that page if you have okay. any questions. Steve, there is a question. Uh, Commissioner Romano. Yeah, I don't know if you could respond to this one, Steve. I'm looking at there's a deputy for the new judge coming in. It looks like it's just one deputy. Mm -hmm. Am I reading this correct? Including his benefits, it's up to $100,000 a mm -hmm. year. Is that based on a 40-hour week, or has this guy got gold teeth? What is this? I don't understand. Uh, that's salary, holiday pay, um, all the benefit packages that go along with it. What's a normal deputy make that is a deputy? Uh, Marv's over there laughing at me. I, I, I don't get it. This guy sits on a chair and watches the courtroom and gets $100,000 a year. Yeah, What's a normal deputy make? Pardon? What's a regular deputy make? Uh, the base salary is 63000 but then you have... Uh, but it still doesn't come up to 100000 Yeah, it does. I mean, if you want detail, I'll give it to you. You've got 16 holidays built in. You have... Um, Man, I'm in the wrong... All right, thanks. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, Commissioner Kraft. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Chair. Joe's just mad he doesn't get the 16 holidays. <laughs> um, my question is, this may just be a typo. Um, in your presentation for uh, under prosecuting attorney, the classification for assistant prosecutor one dash new judge, in our paper version, it's assistant prosecutor four. Yeah, I think we had, we had a one. Or is it a one or? Yeah, it's a one. It's a one? a one? Yeah. Okay, so it's a typo in our yeah. printed book. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you, where, Mr. Where Chair. Uh, page A17 in the printed version where it has personnel changes. Okay, that, that should be up there. okay thank you, Final. Steve. Thank, thank you, you Mr. Much. Chair. Uh, Steve, I don't see anyone else on this section, so okay. if you like. Oh, I didn't see you on here. So, anyway, Commissioner Tokel. Thank you. Um, along the same lines as uh, Commissioner Kraft's questions, where it says um, prosecuting attorney, assistant prosecutor one for the new judge. How do we know that the new judge will be assigned a criminal docket, not a civil or a domestic docket? Every time we add a judge, we have a new uh, prosecutor that goes with that. Even if the judge is assigned a civil docket, you get a new prosecutor? We've done it every time. I, I, I assume this is going to be a, sure to be a criminal explained. docket. I mean, it's what Prosecutor Smith's indicated. We okay. had the same Could five positions every time we had a judge. Okay, can we follow up on that? Because sure. it's my understanding that the new that the new judge is coming in as the civil or a family docket. So if you could follow up on that and let me know. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I don't see any other speakers, at least on this list. Steve, continue. Okay. Um, on slide four, again, this is uh, basically a numerical breakdown of what I spoke about earlier in terms of the overall budget by fund. Um, I've highlighted a few funds here just as, as the kind of the big numbers and these were all highlighted on the previous slide. So the general fund is the first fund, $22.9 million increase, 10.3%. Child care fund, what's happening in there is <clears throat> we have historically budgeted um, personnel at the youth home, basically youth specialists, uh, assuming that we're going to have 100 kids in the youth home. And as we know, we have 30 or 40 or 50 the last couple of years. So we've put in a turnover factor in the child care fund. We haven't done that in the past. We do it in the general fund. So we are now budgeting about 80% of the true salary costs for all, if you added all the positions. So if you look in the back of your budget book, you'll see all the individual positions are still listed. We calculated the total personnel costs for all those positions, and then we reduced it by 20%. And it's kind of trying to, um, I'll call it right size the budget. So we're trying to, uh, build that budget so it's more closely aligned with what we have been spending in actual dollars the last few years. So, and we've budgeted 100 for 100 kids for a number of years. Great. I, I do have a question, Commissioner Majek, as to this. Oh, well, you, you jumped the gun? Yeah. All right, good. Go ahead. Um, <clears throat> so that's what's going on there. Uh, again, the Indigent Defense Council Fund that's just a new fund for the year. We have roads, $32 million increase. We spoke about it a little earlier. And then the debt service funds. So we got the big reduction there due to the accounting change. So um, at Rob the end of the day, $48.5 million increase, 6.7%. And as uh, Commissioner Drillett indicated, we'll kind of recalculate this based on uh, two or three different know, scenarios changes that are being made for the year. 
Good. Commissioner Majek. Yes, Steve, can you just elaborate on the $32 million increase for the roads? Uh, where is that coming from? Uh, is that gas tax at, increase? They're adding uh, three positions. They're at, I'm sure it's all in uh, projects, I, I have to believe. I think. Road project construction. Road project funding. So without Where are we getting that money? Where's that money coming from? Um, That's fine. We got about a $30 million increase in intergovernmental containment in state, state and federal. So I don't know the details okay. necessarily. Brian so we're getting more money from the federal government and right. from, the, from MDOT and uh, uh, from the national government as well yes. for road construction. Right. That's what's going on. Yeah, there. and Brian can speak, you know, answer more of your detailed questions in his budget hearing. Thank you. That's really what's going on in there. Thank you, Commissioner Carabelli. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Juvenile Center, a few years back, we realized that uh, we were manned up pretty heavy to, to fully handle the load. Um, and then they right-sized, I believe it was like three year, years ago or more. Um, and you said we can have 100 uh, visitors and then it's Right now, averaging 30, and you reduce the salary by 80 percent. I mean, to by 20 percent. Well, my math's a little different than yours. I'm understanding a lot of understanding how if you're at 30 percent occupancy, you're keeping all the positions, and you're just budgeting a little less on the wages. I, I don't. I guess we'll wait till the. We're not uh, trying to. We're not trying to cut completely to the bone. I guess is no, what I'm saying. So I, I respect that, and I guess yeah. this is where when we talk to individual department, how many of these residents are St. Clair County, and how many are Macomb? I mean, right. there's a bigger picture here. Mm -hmm. We got to take a look at what these tax dollars being spent there, and, right? And, and, and maybe I that's know recently we were up to about fifty six or fifty seven kids. We're close. Well, okay, getting closer 60. to sixty. My point is, is how many yeah. are our, ours, and how many are we running out the the space for? I, I, I guess we'll just wait till uh, they come here and we can talk mm -hmm. about it at that time. Right, and Commissioner, just so you know, uh, Crystal is does keep a, a list of these questions, whether it be the roads or this, so that we can um, even prep the people coming in. For the vacancy factor from 5% of payroll to 3.5% of payroll, I don't know how much the board wants me to go into detail about that, but generally speaking, uh, we don't spend all of our salary money or salary budget because it takes time to fill vacant positions and all that, but it's been winding itself down the past few years. So this year we have 5% built into the budget. Uh, last year it was 5%, the year before that it was 6 the year before that it was 7%. It's been winding down. We're very close to that 5% again uh, through the uh, summer months of this year. So we're, we're being a little conservative. We're dropping that to 3.5%. So the, all those things combined are leading to an increase because, again, lowering those, the vacancy factor actually increases wage expense, that inverse relationship, because we're assuming we're going to have more payroll expense because we're bringing people on board quicker is what's going on there. <coughs> Fringe benefits are going up uh, roughly the same percent as um, salaries and wages. Supplies and commodities are going down. That is a combination of things going on in there, and I'm going to have to refer to slide nine. Um, so there's three main things going on in there. There's the transfer of the defense attorney costs from the general fund to the MIDC fund. That's about a three six three point six million dollar decrease. <coughs> there's been a, a half a million dollar increase in uh, uh, IT maintenance costs items, systems that were purchased two or three years ago coming off of the maintenance that was included in the initial purchase price. Now we have to purchase maintenance agreements. Um, and I'll just say it now, I'll, I'll not say it later. When we look at the forecast, I've built another $500,000 in every three years just because we've seen this happen for a couple of cycles now. Uh, it's just reality of, of IT. 
<clears throat> and then we rolled in a million seven in uh, those ma annual maintenance items for uh, facilities, the, the tuck pointing, the uh, parking lot repair, the uh, roofing repair, all those things that we've talked about uh, in previous uh, meetings during the course of this year. So, and there's some other increases going on in there, but that all lets itself out to a $2 million decrease. Contract services is going up 800 and almost $900,000. Uh, the main driver there is a $700,000 increase that we built in for uh, jail medical. So there's a bid on the street right now for uh, jail medical services. Hopefully by the time the sheriff comes at the end of September, we'll have those bids back and uh, at least have some idea of what that increase is. That's 700,000. Um, internal services, uh, a main driver there is an increase in liability insurance chargeback. And again, we're self-insured for the first $750,000 of a claim. And what we've seen is a very substantial increase as um, John Chapka is updating you every month on in litigation from the Sheriff's Department. And those are big claims. Every one of them is a big claim. So we've seen a large increase in our total overall liability for outstanding litigation. It's uh, taken its toll on the liability insurance fund. So we've had to increase the chargeback rate to the departments to uh, replenish the fund and cover our uh, anticipated uh, liabilities. Again, this is more it's informational. For a number of years, we've charged 1% of payroll across all departments. Uh, we're now increasing that to 1.5% for general employees, and we've raised it to 4.5% for sheriff because the majority of the claims come from the sheriff's department. So you'll see, a, and that's going to be a general theme. That, so when you are looking at all departments, you're, in that internal service line, you'll see increases in almost every department. Some will be lower, uh, larger than others, depending on the size of the line item, but generally speaking, uh, and the most of it's going to be in the sheriff's department because we basically quadrupled the rate. But we're, we're being hit very, very hard with with lawsuits. <coughs> um, capital outlay. Again, we have a number of one-time items related to the sheriff's department. It costs a significant amount of money to outfit these new deputies with radios and tasers and uh, so on and so forth. Um, so there's money built in for that. There's Steve, Steve, can I stop you for one second? Sure. I have two commissioners on the list that I think want to. Uh, Commissioner Brown, are you still uh, have a question? Okay, Commissioner Carabelli. Very quick, Mr. Chairman. Steve, the maximum report, I know how we divide out the services that departments are using and they pay accordingly. I get it. But it, I, I'd like to see it truer than most because. When we talk about the sheriff's department is using the majority of some of those funds, I don't want to see it spread apart, spread throughout the county evenly. I want it spread to they're paying that and it's showing that that is costing the county X amount of dollars. I don't want to have the, uh, uh, an example, uh, um, the pound paying for 1.5% increase when the cost is really coming from the sheriff's office for that increase. You see what I'm trying to say? I'd rather see it wholeheartedly so we know that sheriff's de uh, department or the jail, whatever it is, is physically costing us X amount of dollars and it's not spread so we don't see the true cost of that. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? Are you, I think I do. Are you suggesting that we include an indirect cost charge to the general fund departments that we currently and historically have not? Yeah, I'm saying that. So if, we, we typically if department allocate X that. is a reason for a $5 million yeah. increase. I don't want to spread it amongst all the other departments. I want to say my true cost for that department X is holy cow. Not, oh, that's kind of high. You know what I'm saying? I don't want to have it spread out to everybody. If it's attributed to one, it should be shown. Well, they do. Withdraw let from me, general let me fund back up a little bit and say that historically we've only allocated the indirect cost charges to the grant funds that, because they pick it. Now, that I get. But what happens is when Maximus prepares the plan, they will spread 
costs from the, we call them the central service departments. And they'll spread those costs based on some allocation statistics. And I, I you know, I'm gonna use the finance department for example. I believe the allocation statistic is number of transactions in the accounting system. So total costs of the finance department spread by department based on their percentage of total transactions. And, and that makes sense to right. me. Right, and same thing with Corp Council. It's based on, I think it's based on percentage of total well, wages. The way you, you kind of said it, you said because of some lawsuits and certain things. I want to say if it's attributed to a specific department, we know the true cost so that it, the daylight is shined upon it and it's not spread to every department where yeah you know, we got a problem but everybody's paying a portion of it and the reality it's really coming from one area and we're spreading that around so if 75 percent of corporation council is attributed to the uh, a department then it should show 75 percent of that cost to that department out of the general fund we need to see that because you don't realize how much it's really costing you unless you break it out that way i would say this if the cost of all the central service departments are being allocated proportionately and equitably based on their utilization of whatever those, that department expenses. What we don't do today is charge the finance department indirect costs or corporation council indirect costs. We so, that, yeah. Now, I'm not suggesting that that wouldn't be a good thing to do it would inflate the revenues and the expenses, but I'm not suggesting it's a bad thing. I'm, I'm certainly not. Right. I'm not. I'm certainly not suggesting that we not do that. I'm just. Yeah. That's all right. Hey, St Steve, I have one question for you, and and this has just come to light. We started talking a little more about um, the sheriff department and and how the communities pay for their services. Have we ever? I mean, I know that the law is generally that we are, we're required to provide a jail and. And I mean, I, I don't know all the re all what we're really required of jail. I mean, a patrol to cover county some county roads or whatever it might be a part of that. I don't know, but have we ever done a study to make sure that the communities that we are actually patrolling are covering the cost of everything that goes along with it? Because we take tax money from everywhere in the whole county to pay for the sheriff's department, and I, uh, you know, we all love the sheriff's department, but I want to make sure that we've looked at. I don't know if you look it's at it on a regular. It's been a few years, well, a number of years. I'll yeah. not say and I know you. Yeah, I know you update yeah. this it's stuff. It's been a number of we, uh, years, but. Um, Hi, Mall. Yeah. I, I can't remember how long ago it was, but it was. We we did that. Is that how you do it when you bring new communities in? Is that what you base your what they cost, uh, what it costs when bring, them? Or? When we bring a new community in, well, let me back up. If a new community wants new officers or an existing community wants new officers to their existing complement, we'll price it out based on the cost of that new person plus some overhead plus vehicle and plus gas. But we, I, I know what you're saying. It's been a number of years since we've done it. The sheriff, um, you know, we had our meeting a few weeks ago, so I've kind of put the sheriff on alert that this kind of question might come up so he can more intelligently answer yeah, it. That's fine, and that's from, you know, from your perspective. I don't know, yeah. I know you guys cost this out because you have to have some kind of right. cost in mind when you're when someone wants a new deputy or complete coverage, whatever it might be. I just don't know how you guys do it or when, but I mean it's based obviously- based on actual position. Yeah. You know, the, the actual positions needed depending on the coverage that they're requesting. Okay. So right, but it all that, depends on if it's a- but that is a study you guys have, have done in the past, right. right, obviously, to look at this. Okay. Yeah. It's been a number of years since I, I know where you're asking, but it's mm -hmm. been a number of years since we've kind of done that analysis. Um, yeah, I would say more than that, actually. In other words, I mean, I guess the argument, you know, the, the, the um, I don't want to say an argument, but the theory could be that the communities in the South End are paying for Detective Bureau, I guess. For I, example, I, I mean, I, right. you could make, somebody could make that claim. I Listen, I'm, I'm, I'm basic. I'm just saying that yeah. with everything, you know, we update how we price things out because it is a charge for services. So mm -hmm. I know that you've done that recently with animal control and different things and like we do that. that. Yeah, with the, with the positions that are being requested that are being part, of, you know, are funded through a contract. Those are costed out on current costs. Okay. Current costs of a deputy plus, you know, salaries, fringes, overhead, vehicle if it's needed, which in most cases it is gas. Great. Okay. Uh, Defender of the North. 
<laughs> Commissioner Brown. <laughs> you know, sounds like the South won the Civil War here. You know, we're a union, not a confederacy, my friends. <laughs> we got to protect the whole country, not the whole, not just parts of it. Um, we could also do a study about the zip codes in the jail. How many people use the jail? Right? I mean, uh, I don't think, so how many, how many, what are, how many zip codes use the county health department's services? And then say, well, are we allocating that cost properly? I mean, so, but the sheriff has done those studies, but, but, but the interesting thing is how do they look, like, it's the detective bureaus, the, the, the SWAT teams, the special units, uh, how do they factor those costs in? And I don't know how they do that. I, I don't, they probably say they do, but I don't know how they do it. So interesting thought, in, interesting thought, but that leads other discussions. So we go down that road, we'll, we'll go down the road. <laughs> Thank you. Well, or a dirt road if you're up there. <laughs> well, if you have a road, you don't even have roads half the time. There's no so electricity up there path. either, I think. <laughs> Got cow pass and farm pass. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Drillet. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It sounds like Steve has kind of answered the question. We don't need necessarily a study to know how much it costs us to hire a police officer. I mean, we know how much the cost to hire an officer. We know how much their fringe benefits cost. We know how much their uh, a vehicle cost. Um, all we have to do is look and see how much they cost, and that's how much we charge. And I recognize the chair's point is that there are some central services like the uh, a detective bureau that are harder to uh, apportion uh, and maybe a little more difficult to do. It's relatively minor, I would think, amount. So I don't know that you know we need to do some sort of giant study to figure out how much it costs us to hire a police officer and what their fringe benefits cost. Uh, we could put uh, Commissioner Romano on studying those costs and fringe benefits of these deputies. Yeah, but I, I thought the, the question was a different <laughs> question in my mind. I think it is fairly straightforward for us to determine the cost of a position. Right, right. No. And that's what those uh, communities are. That's are, what they're paying. They're essentially buying, you know, uh, is right. positions. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, thank you. And Steve, you said you've done something like this in the past. It's just been a lot of years. I was just questioning if you yeah. guys are looking at something like that or not, if that's a possibility. Commissioner Sauger. <clears throat> yeah, every, over the years, every township, they negotiate their the contract with the county, with their cities, their townships. They're satisfied and we're satisfied. If, there's a, if it's not enough, then they go back and back and forth. But as far as uh, uh, saying we might overcharge them, I don't, never in all my years no. I was on department have I ever seen a township or a city pull out, we're getting charged too much. You know, they're all satisfied, and they negotiate for months and months and months. And I talked to different supervisors, and they said they're happy as hell with what they got going on. But if we're going to sit here and say, you know, maybe we should find this out, find that, they've already done all that. They've come to the best price possible, and they're happy with it. So end of the, end of the discussion, as far as I'm concerned. Commissioner Brown, did you want to discuss how you pay too much or no? I'm just kidding. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Steve, uh, continue, please. Okay. Uh, next line, uh, transfers out to the Capital Improvement Fund. Self-explanatory. We've, we've only put a little bit of money in this year based on projects that have actually been uh, presented to the board and approved. Uh, that's not updated, obviously, for the, the, uh, the jail bed project from yesterday, for example. Um, but we have the full... Uh, cost in for 2019 as a, as a reflection of what we uh, expect to happen. So that's showing a large increase. Um, the transfer out to the debt service fund, there's a reduction there of about a million four. Again, in prior years, we had a million and a half built in for debt service on a new bond issue for capital projects. So that's no longer in the budget. And then a uh, $2 million increase in transfers out to other funds. That's a combination of a number of things. You know, we, we transfer money to, to have a lot of grant funds, basically. But <clears throat> so there's about a $2.8 million, I want to say, transfer to the new MIDC fund. There's a reduction in the transfer to the child care fund, as we spoke about earlier, in terms of a reduction in cost uh, at the youth home. We, the general fund pays 50% of those costs. So th those two things, I think, are the biggest things going on in there overall. Uh, about a $2 million increase. Again, bottom line, um, about a 10.3% increase in total expenses. Um, but again, we'll factor in capital improvements and debt service and those sorts of things and kind of, you know, 
see what it would be if we didn't have these kind of accounting change things going on. <coughs> okay. Moving on, the next two slides again are just graphical representations of revenues and expenses. So slide seven, 53% um, of the revenues in the general fund come from property taxes, another 16% from inter intergovernmental, which is liquor tax and revenue sharing, court financing, PPT reimbursement. Um, those are the, the big ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, charges for services uh, and reimbursements, 19.2. Um, indirect costs are 7%. Fines and licenses, permits, interests, all that sort of thing, 1%. And transfers in, again, that's uh, most of the transfers in is the $8 million that the general fund uh, receives every year from the tax revolving fund from the treasurer's office. That's the, the biggest item there. Uh, slide eight is the uh, similar representation only on the expense side. Again, salaries and benefits are about 58% of our costs in the general fund. Um, debt service is about 4%. 6% for capital improvements, capital outlay is about one for the departments in the general fund, um, supplies 11%, but again, I guess the highlight here is salaries and benefits are about 58% of the total expenses in the general fund. <coughs> uh, slide nine basically, uh, as well as slide 10, are narrative descriptions of what I just went over in terms of the general fund. Um, we can talk more if you wish. I think I covered most of them uh, in uh, uh, detail. I'll uh, skip ahead to slide 11. This is simply a uh, representation of what's happened with property values since 2008. And you can see, of course, as we all know, the big decrease of about 27% from 2009 to 2013. It's steadily increased since then. Uh, we are close to being back to where we were. Uh, we'll be back there in about three or four years. Again, we've got uh, increases of three and a half built in for 19, three uh, percent for 20, two and a half, and then two uh, going out into the future. Uh, slide 12, uh, I'd just like to put this in. Uh, it's a um, indicator of the comparison of state equalized value of property, uh, real property. And I'm highlighting real property here because we know with all the personal property tax reform, our personal property taxable value varies from year to year. So you might actually have a, you know, not as large of an increase in overall taxable value. Um, so, uh, but the main point here is that the spread between taxable and state equalized value is uh, growing, which gives us some cushion in case we have uh, some tough economic times. So as, as you know, taxable values according in uh, pursuant to Prop A are limited in, in increase to the lower of uh, inflation or 5%, but assessed values can you know, go up based on the market. <coughs> and so this spread gives us some cushion in case we have a done or 2008 or something along those lines. So it's, it's good to have that cushion there. Steve, very, very quickly, <coughs> go back to what you just said. So that spread. So let's, yeah, I'm sorry. Just a quick question. So we have a 2008 that happens again. Explain that while I'm looking at this chart here. So what happens Previous. is, yeah. so what can happen in the case of a 2008, you right. might have assessed value or, or true cash value of property going down. And at the same time, you could have taxable values going up until they reach a point where they meet. Okay. And then taxable becomes equal to um, uh, SEV. Gotcha. <coughs> and so you can see that happening in 2009, 10, 11, where that, that gap is, and if I if I'd made this graph going back to, say, 2000, you would have saw that spread, and then it goes like this, and now it's going like this again. Gotcha. So. Thanks. So even though, you know, Property the taxable values dropped twenty almost twenty seven percent in that five year gap. I can't remember, but assessed values dropped more than that because again, 
two components, as we know, pretty much uh, account for all of the changes in taxable value, inflation plus new growth. And so you always can have an inflationary factor even though you have a market downturn for a few years. <coughs> <coughs> Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Steve, how are you, uh, are you getting your, your forecasting information from the Equalization Department? Where are you coming up? Uh, we'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> Carry on. Oh, I'm sorry, Commissioner Kleinfeld. Well, I'm just wondering um, if it would be better if we go through the slides and then do the questioning. Um, it, it moves pretty fast if he says they're coming up on one. I'd like to get the, the questions answered uh, on topic of that okay. we've already asked for. But uh, okay. If, okay. Yeah. Thanks. So the next slide is actually addresses kind of how we've estimated things, at least for 2019. We're also thinking that things are going to uh, continue on for 2020, but we're, we're kind of winding down the increases. So, um, as you know, property taxes and uh, or property values, taxable values, are limited in growth by the rate of inflation or 5% plus whatever new growth is out there. So, <coughs> we are tracking every month the inflationary factor that the state uses to uh, authorize or build into uh, author authorized increases, and that comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. And so through July 31st, it's tracking at 2.5%. So that 2.5% will just be built in right off the top. <clears throat> to get to 3.5%, we need another 1% growth. Taxable values are about $27.1 billion this year. 1% of that's 271 million. We have 18 or 1,900 new housing starts every year. We've had it for every year for the last few years. Um, if you use it, we're using an estimate of $300,000 for a new build up in the north end. All the growth is happening in the new north end pretty much. Um, so using $300,000 true cost of a new build, those get built into taxable value at half that. So at 1,800 houses, this is just residential only, nothing accounting for construction for industrial or commercial. Um, you're close to that $271 million mark. SEMCOG, we get our housing data from SEMCOG that they're a few months behind. Um, it's about 1,000, a little over 1,000 new permits pulled this year, and that was through May. I looked in May. It's not been updated since. So it, it'll trickle up, <coughs> uh, increase over the course of the summer. So that's kind of how we get to our three and a half. Expect the economy to be strong for the next year or two. So we're kind of winding it down, though. We don't want to build in three and a half every year. Um, so... Again, at some point in time, you get to a point where maybe your 2% increase is just inflation. And you're always going to get that. Now, that inflation hasn't been 2% every year for the last 20 years. There's points in time where we were only at 1% or 0.9 just a few years ago. But last it was 2.1% last year or for, for this year from last year. We're looking at 25 for this year for next year. So that's kind of how we're building our how we're building our forecasts. <clears throat> the next slide is just a, a a bar graph or a chart on the number of new housing starts for the last seven or eight nine years. So again, consistently in that eighteen to nineteen hundred dollar range or eighteen hundred to nineteen hundred range for new building permits. We're going to shift completely to more on uh, funding levels and debt profile. Uh, this is something that's new this year. I typically haven't provided uh, any information on debt other than the debt service requirements for the next uh, three years. So slide 15 is just uh, a chart on the funding level of the pension plan. So good news on the pension plan. Uh, we received the actuarial report uh, within the last uh, month or so. The funding level at the end of 2017 was just shy of 98 percent. And uh, it was 92 percent uh, in 2016, 92 or 92 and a half the year before. About half of that increase is being driven by investment performance in 2017. Um, 
our target is seven and a quarter. I think we were closer on a market value basis at about 17%, 16.5. That gets smoothed over five years, as most of you probably know, so we don't get the full benefit of that. That did decrease the contribution to the pension plan by about $2.7 million for the general and sheriff groups, so that's been built into the budget as well. Uh, don't know if that's, you can't predict that that's going to happen every year, but um, it was good news for 2017. The other half of the increase was driven by what we call demographic changes, which could be a combination of people leaving employment earlier than expected or leaving employment before they're vested, leaving the drop sooner, number of things. So that half of the increase was due to that, half the increase was due to uh, investment performance. So just wanted to give the board an update on the uh, funding of the pension plan. It's very, uh, very uh, well funded. We talked yesterday about the retiree health care plan. I don't have a, a slide in here on that. At the end of 2015, it was 35 and a half percent funded. I hope <laughs> that the uh, results for 2016 will be re re uh, released here shortly. Um, 16, we had a good investment year, and again in 17, I would expect a very good year for the funding level of the health care plan as well. Um, but I don't have uh, anything really to update the board on that. <clears throat> I'll move on to two th uh, slide 16. So this starts to get into our debt profile. <clears throat> and so what I have here is a graph of what our actual debt service requirements are for the uh, period up to 2035, which is the year that all of the existing debt is paid down. And you'll, I've, I've got little bubbles here about where significant decreases are. So in 2022, you'll see, or 2023, there's a big decrease uh, because the youth home or T-Berry renovation bonds are paid off. Again, in 2000. Uh, 26, you'll see another significant decrease. The 800 megahertz uh, bonds are retired. You'll see a very large decrease in 2031 because the central campus bonds are paid down. At that point in time, the only remaining bond issue, if nothing else happens between now and then, will be the retiree health care bonds, and those are paid off in 2035. So you can see down at the bottom where we start getting reductions in our debt service requirements, which you'll see in the forecast, it, you know, helps the bottom line. So uh, just wanted to let the board know what was going on there. The next slide is the principal reductions by bond issue from the same period of time from 2019 through 2035. So you can see uh, when those uh, larger issues start to drop off. We have a, a one that drops off at, in 2019 and one that drops off at the end of 2020. So smaller ones. Uh, we have another smaller one, the public works uh, and the works warehouse refunding issue uh, drops off in 2024, but the bigger ones I highlighted on the previous slide. <coughs> slide uh, 18, this is a, a bar graph that shows by year the percentage of existing debt that's paid down by year. So you'll see that in 2019, we will pay down 6% of the bonds or the debt that's outstanding at the end of 18. By 2020, we pay down 12% in total, 24%. So you'll go down up to, say, 2028. So in 10 years, we've paid down 59% of the debt that was outstanding at the end of 2018, or will be. We haven't paid all of our principal payments this year. but So that's just more informational. And again, by 2035, all the existing debt is retired. So <clears throat> this is maybe the most, uh, a very interesting graph, and this is something that uh, Commissioner Carabelli has talked to me about. Uh, Commissioner, uh, Steve, Don, uh, Commissioner Brown okay. had a question. I just want to. sorry. Don't know, that, that was me. I missed it. He just likes hearing his name. <laughs> <laughs> Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so um, what you have on slide 19 is a bar graph of our total debt, including all public works drainage debt, 
as a percentage of all governmental funds revenue, which includes the general fund, the roads, all governmental funds, special revenue funds, the debt service fund, for example. And this is one of the parameters or one of the gauges or param I'll call them parameters that the rating agencies use um, to uh, build into our credit score, basically. The other uh, um, uh, item that they include in our debt profile is debt service as a percentage of total expense, and that we're, we're fine there. We're five or six percent. Where it, if it's less than eight percent, it's very good in their eyes. This is where we have some uh, information or some things we need to be aware of. So <clears throat> if you, if your total debt as a percentage of revenue is 30 percent or less, it's basically very strong. If it's 30 to 60, it's strong. If it's 60 to 120, it's adequate. If it's 120 to 180, it's weak. And if it's over 180 percent, it's very weak. We're weak. So our debt profile, according to Standard Poor's, is weak. And in that every category, uh, I guess I don't want to get too much in the way, I don't have all the data, but they score us in seven different categories. And one is the best you can get in any particular category, very strong. Five is very weak, it's the worst you can get. They weight the dif different categories. This is one of the categories. <coughs> it's only 10% of the score. So it doesn't necessarily nick us very heavily, but it does. So you can see that we're at 163.8% or 164% for all intents and purposes at the end of 17. That threshold is 180 before we go to a very weak. So, you know, um, Commissioner Caravelli has raised the question of, well, the county historically has always pledged their full faith and credit on public works debt. You can see that it's about 50-50. So of that 164%, it's pretty much 50-50 between drainage debt and uh, general county debt. And the reason that is is because in 2015, you'll see, if you go down to the bottom, so the purple bar is our general county debt, you'll see that that spiked way up from 12% to 94% in 15. Well, that's when we issued the retiree health care bonds and um, the central campus bonds. Prior to that, we were in a, a the strong category. We were in a three instead of a four. So at the end of the day, we, um, Commissioner Carabelli, we can issue about $125 million of debt before we go into a, a five. So that's either issuing new debt of our own or, or pledging our full faith and credit on drainage debt. Okay. I have Commissioner Kleinfeld on the list first. Um, thank you. and. Commissioner Carabelli, when you came up with this in that other meeting, it's something that I really wouldn't have thought of. Um, and now that we're addressing it, I really appreciate that. When we did, when um, Andy Levin came in front of us for that solar, those, and we did a full faith and credit on the loans that would be used for that, did, does that apply? Do you Andy guys Levin. know what I'm talking about? I think there was one I think there's been one for right that's for but like a hundred and eighty or a couple hundred thousand, but that's for the um, pace program, the pace right. program that uh, the that that the, the treasurer had to sign off on. That um, you know basically if they it doesn't get paid, so it, it, they, it, it only goes on the tax rolls. There, well, we did have to pledge a full faith and credit. Right, and it it, it, it only ended up being one project, but I yeah. think at the time we agreed to pledge for quite a bit of money, it was several million, I thought, and I don't even remember what the number was, but I wanted to know if that also would have counted against this, and I it think probably it would, would have. Because yeah. even though it's not direct debt for the drains, it's being paid for by special assessments, yeah. we've basically co-signed on it. So we've never had a default, but th they're rating us based on worst case scenario. So here's the other question. The reason that we do that is because she saves on bonds. Uh, uh, because she's got rate. our full faith and credit, right? But then, the, so, but then we lose on bonds. 
what in in what his question was is which is bigger which is a bigger benefit and okay you probably were going to ask it anyway so i'll just <laughs> i'll just let go thank you commissioner carabelli thank you mr chairman now with this information <clears throat> if we were underneath the radar and we got full credit of those 10 points would it put us at we lose yeah we if, lose. if we if we were in just a purple and we had no orange or whatever color that is, would we be triple A? No. What percentage would it move us up to? And, and here's if, my if question. If we had none of this? What, just let me, let me ask the whole question, yeah. then you can answer it. So if I didn't have that, and those drain projects that are individual, usually to a community area or to a uh, synergy uh, a district, they bear the, f the cost of that. So for example, the uh, the sinkhole that just happened, that district emit is paying for that, but our full faith and credit. So every taxpayer in the county is affected because it could affect what we're borrowing money for the percentage on a project that's countywide. I don't know if I made that, if I said it the right way. So what they're doing, I understand we're pledging that increase of her not having that and it's just that district that's responsible for it. What would her bond rate be at that point how much more would it be than if we didn't back it dollars and cents wise and then if we were clean and it increased us borrowing money for the central campus or any other projects a possible jail whatever it may be in the future what percentage would we save so I, I'd like to see the difference and I know it's a lot of math for somebody to sit down and try to well think. and I you, you don't know depending on market conditions and so on at this point in time, if we had no full faith and credit pledge on any public works debt, our profile score would be a three instead of a four, and that would be about a one-tenth of a point change in our overall score. We would still be a, a double A plus. And it wouldn't increase our... our, our no, because <clears throat> the market says, well, are you a triple A or a double A plus or a double A or a double A minus? At this point, it's not changing the overall rating okay. at this point and, and but I'll, I'll it leave certainly isn't going to help if we go uh, down a, a tenth but well that, and that's i guess offline we can talk some more about this because i'd like to see the ramifications of especially with projects we have coming up and what would it be and somebody run the math of if we didn't pledge that yeah yeah it's hard to tell what the interest what the market would bear in terms of interest rates i mean i can reach out to uh the financial advisor uh, for Public Works, and just kind of get a feel for what he th would think the change in interest rate would be. It, it's hard to tell, depending on, depending on issue size and all those sorts of things. But I, I understand where you're coming from. Okay, and then again, when you get a moment, I'd like to see what factors are affecting us from getting back to where we were. Not now, but when yeah, you get a chance. I can tell you it's, it's uh, what they refer to as the economy. Okay. Yeah. Personal yeah. income, per capita income, and property values. We can. Yep. And just to carry on with Commissioner Carabelli's, I think that what we'd probably like to see, and you probably have to have thought of this already, is that um, we have to have something in the future that we're looking at that sooner or later we say, well, we can't, we can't pledge our full faith and credit exactly. because we're going to lose this. So, I mean, yeah, there has a to matrix. be. They, they, yeah, so that's right. what we want to make Stanford sure that. Stanford has provided me a matrix. Okay. Yeah. And I did this. At, so Public Works, remember, we just pledged our full faith and credit on a refunding mm -hmm. issue in the summer. <laughs> After that point in time, I got their matrix because if you remember in 2013, they downgraded us mm -hmm. and they came out with this matrix system and there's these seven categories and there's basically a five by five chart and depending on the print, you know, the items that they score against on each category, you get a score and they weight the categories and. Right, and that's really the, 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 what my concern would be is that you knew way before we decided what we we're going to do how it would affect us before we did it and that's mm -hmm. my concern and yeah. then uh, just a question and i know we have a couple of speakers um is that a possibility say it's a drainage district that needed it is a possibility that just the communities that are affected by that it, that are part of that drainage district pledge their full faith and credit ever instead of the county or does mm -hmm. it always have to be the county because it's the county it's always in my experience it's always been the entire okay. county it's just just checking. yeah i don't you know and um, if we didn't then oh. they would have you know a larger obviously a larger interest rate or a higher interest rate because right. there's no fallback for those drainage districts. They're all 
special assessment. So I'll yeah. pretty much collect what they need to pay their debt plus some small margin there. Got so, it. Commissioner Majek. Yeah, thank you. So is this standard in the industry? So like Oakland County, when they when they do their uh, budget overview like this, they're including the drain and county debt together. Is that what Wall Street looks at also? Yeah, they'll 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 do that same. That matrix applies to gotcha. all governments. Okay. Now, whether I can't answer whether Oakland County always pledges their full faith and credit on their special assessment that I, I would presume they do, but I don't really know that. I haven't reached out to them or any other county to. Uh, and the Fraser sinkhole, that 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 that's that would be included here, right? It is here. Yeah. Okay. So you'll see on the on the orange bars or down below in yep. the. Uh, 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 table, you'll see that the drainage debt percentage went from 70 to 83 okay. in 2017. That's when the sinkhole bonds were issued. Gotcha. And then you you mentioned that uh, based on the amount of debt we currently have, we can afford 125 more in debt until we reach that next and threshold. And that's pop, that's that what pops us over the 180 percent, which we don't want to be at. Right, because we don't we want to. Yeah, we. So um, it would most likely change our debt profile score to okay. a weak or very weak. So what are you doing and what is what are we doing as the county um, to look at that forecast? We have to be cognizant of that with all these projects and capital projects to avoid that. Right. Is so that whenever we, I mean, we may be in a situation where we have to issue debt and we may have no choice, but there's certainly a, a, uh, an item that needs to be addressed or something, a score we need to evaluate, I guess, okay. at that point. So the reason why I'm talking to you about this is I, I serve in the mid board uh, with Candace Miller, yeah. and I'm very concerned um, because uh, the Public Works Department is sort of completing their study of the needs of the mid district. We're not f we'll be finishing that at the end of the year, okay? And I'm not gonna go with through some numbers right now. Um, potentially there could be, it could be very expensive to uh, do what we need to do at the Public Works, the mm -hmm. mid board, to get everything up to date and fixed and upgraded, things like that. And I'm concerned with that and, and how, how that would play a role. So in other words, let's yeah. say, I'm just throwing a hypothetical number out there, let's say 50 million in sewer needs to the mid district, would we potentially have to then borrow that and that would be on the books here? Uh, that would be for, on the books debt. here, that would affect this score. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we all of us have to know that we're on different drainage boards, but mm -hmm. I am on the mid and uh, I'm very, very concerned about that, but we'll have to all be on the same page and coordinate together to, to make sure we get it done right. Thank you. Right. Thanks, Commissioner Brown. Do we have a list of how many communities we've backed with full faith and credit behind other bonds like are made of other places we, we've backed? We're back to other bond issues. We could compile that. I don't yeah, have them. We, we've always done it. Right. Whenever the committees come in here. We've never turned anybody down. Yeah, we have but a list. We're going to start sending them to Shelby Township where they got more money than most people do. <laughs> they, they can back them. But for right now, so we have, it's always been us. We, we have a list of all the drainage debt. I'd have to follow through with Public Works to find out which communities were in, you know, involved in each of those issues. I guess it, it's I mean, not it's a major concern because the economy's strong right now, but but there was a time when some communities were weak and they made default, and right. we'd be on hook, and, and that yeah, would obviously affect our credit score too, right? Because because we're back in somebody else's bonds, like I do back well, my kids' kid car. Yeah, right? I mean, fortunately, we've never had a default, no. and there's some you know abilities to go against property and so on and so forth. We've never had a default. Just something to think about. Yeah. The There's range a lot of things that we're considering. How many communities we've actually got right. out there that got notes that we've backed. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Drillat. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Steve, has the executive uh, concerned about the uh, prospect of a, of a jail project bumping us over that line? I haven't discussed that yet with them. I mean, it, it, depending on the size of the issue. Right. Again, we got about $125 million of uh, ability or a cushion there to, uh, but we, we the jail study is not far along far enough to even have an idea of what that would be. But this is something that we, I will discuss with them once the numbers come in. Right, because I, I, I can't remember what the numbers that have been proposed for the jail project. Uh, and I know it's, there's no specific project in front of us either, to, but I mean, it, right. 
Uh, that, that's something we should certainly be cognizant about because, um, as you said, we're we're not that far away from that mark, and right. that's that's the only thing I can think of. Is there any other un, uh, thing on the horizon that you that, that you that the, you guys foresee that could be a possible uh, debt of that nature? Not, yeah, not direct debt. What I what I would refer to as direct debt or accounting debt, not that I can think of. Okay. I think you know most. So right now, um, about half of the debt is county and half of the debt's public works, roughly speaking. Right, right. So there's no other debt that we can see county-wise necessarily that we can force The jail is the one I can think of. conceptualize in my mind at this point. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. I don't have any other speakers at this time. Okay, so that completes the debt profile. So the next slide is the 10-year forecast, and again, um, this is in millions, and you can see that uh, for 2017, we had about an $8 million drawdown on fund balance. Fund balance was uh, $53.6 million. Uh, we're projecting a $2.8 million surplus this year. We haven't had that much in capital projects. Most of the projects this year are being funded through that carryover from 2017. Um, we've got a, a drawdown again in 2017. Uh, 19 of about 5.6 million. Um, again, we've got about 13.6 million dollar uh, contribution budgeted for the uh, uh, capital improvements. Um, so, you know, we, you can see down toward the bottom that our fund balance is right in that 20 percent range. I mean, we, you know, we got to be very careful about where we go with that. You can see starting in 22, we it starts. Uh, going up every year, but again, as indicated in the previous slide, our, our debt service payments started dropping off there, and so we're getting some relief on the debt side, assuming nothing else happens. Um, as in prior years, um, we know that on, on the operating side, contract services, we don't spend 100% of the budget, so I've got a, uh, about a 5% cushion in here, uh, about $2 million uh, budgetary savings on the operating side. Um, again, we've got a uh, three and a half percent turnover factor built into 19, three percent um, built in every year after that. If you know we come in and turnover factor is four percent, that's good news. If it's two and a half percent, that's bad news. So um, again, small surpluses starting in 21. Um, and then again, we start getting relief on the debt service side, assuming nothing else happens. So um, that's what uh, the general fund looks like. The next slide then is a graphical representation of the fund balance as a percentage. Again, I've got <coughs> the 15% mark uh, in red, 20% in green. Um, you know, you want to definitely be between be between 15 and 20, preferably at 20 or above. Um, and the last slide is indicating what the uh, fund balance total of the delinquent tax fund and the general fund is by year. Again, the rating agencies would like this at 75%. They say that if we're material, materially below 75% for a a sustained period of time, then that could put pressure on the rating. What their definition of materially, we were at 74% uh, uh, in the last rating, and it, you know, didn't um, uh, didn't affect us. They still said we had um, very strong uh, budgetary flexibility. They call it. It's one of the rating, one of the categories. But you can see, in 1920, 21, we're Closer to 72, 73, whether they would consider that materially below, I don't know. I, you know, uh, Then we start you know, heading back up toward the 75% mark. Um, again, this is assuming not much growth in the delinquent property tax fund, uh, which is a good news, bad news sort of thing. So when the economy is good, the delinquent tax fund you know, is not generating as much in interest and penalties and all that sort of thing because we're not 
not as many properties are, are going delinquent. When the economy's bad, that fund earns more money. So it's a, you know, I like to refer to it as a love-hate relationship kind of a thing. <clears throat> so we don't, we get pretty much steady growth here. Be steady, steady as you go on that. I think we got a million dollar surplus built in every year for the delinquent tax revolving fund over and above the eight million that it contributes to the general fund. So it's, we're, you know, right where we, we don't want to be much different than what this indicates here, um, where it could put some pressure on our rating. And that's it. <clears throat> Commissioner Drillout, are you still on from last time? Okay. Commissioner Romano. Mr. Spiegel, you do know your P's and Q's. I have to give you that. I don't recall last year going through all of this, but I'll tell you what, it's very informative. It's a lot of information to absorb at one meeting. Uh, I like the graphs. That certainly helps along. Um, and I don't know if I speak for the entire board, but I'm sure that I do when I say you made a great presentation. Thank you Thank very you. much. Appreciate it. I think the debt profile is its an interesting it's interesting information to know. I mean, you know, when you look at all the rating categories, all seven of those, and where we fit and what we can do to get to a next upgrade in a category, um, the economy, I'm, I'm, I don't want to belabor the point, but the economy is 30% of the weight or 30% of the score. The two parameters or two items that they gauge or rate um, and score are per capita income and true cash value of property um, per capita. <clears throat> and so there's different parameters, and um, we might be able to get to a, the next category based on property values if the, if the market stays, you know, strong as it is. The per capita income, we've got, you know, there's just challenges there of moving up to a next. So they give us an adequate, which is a three, but it's 30% of the score. So they get to a strong, which is a two. We, there's only a certain number of things that can happen for that to happen, and it'll be a challenge. So um, quickly, the, so you've got uh, the economy is 30% of the score, management is 10% or 20% of the score. We get very strong on management. Budget flexibility, which is fund balance, we get very strong. Budget performance, which is income or loss as a percentage of expenses, we get an adequate, so that's a three. Liquidity, we get very strong. It's tied into fund balance in cash. Uh, the debt profile is a four. That's a very or a weak. And then they call what's called institutional framework. And we get a strong. And every community in the state gets institutional framework. It's more of a gauge of the ability to raise taxes and revenues from the state. So the, the kind of the financing structure is similar across all local units of government. So everybody in the state gets a strong. So anyway, so you add all that up, weight it, do the math, and Here then there's are. a very tight scale of where you fit for a triple A or a double A plus or a double A, a double A minus, triple B plus, whatever, you know. So Commissioner Carabelli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I concur with uh, Commissioner Giuseppe. So thank you. You're welcome. Um, Appreciate the compliments. With that uh, said, um, <clears throat> Last year I had asked, um, and I haven't received it, maybe we did and I misplaced it, is uh, the county asset, the county owned property and buildings. I know that the uh, um, green office is going through theirs and looking at it and selling some assets um, or property, whatever you wanna word it as. I'd like to know uh, where we're at with the county owned assets. I know uh, the bank sold, come back, sold, mm -hmm. Now, supposedly, it's not ours anymore. Mm -hmm. But there's other things, like as I look in the capital improvement, a quarter million dollars for the Majestic building, um, which is down in Warren mm -hmm. on Van Dyke, quarter million dollars to put on a rooftop unit. I look at it, uh, um, Health and Human Services has a program, I think a child care program in there, and then the rest of it is rent from the state. You have Michigan Works in there, you have, um, Health and Human Services from the State of Michigan, I think, in there. 
I think about a quarter of the building, and that's about a quarter of the building. The other quarter of the building is vacant, and the other quarter of the building includes a Dollar General, includes a uh, beauty supply, no, the beauty supply moved, uh, and includes a restaurant. So with that said, is it feasible for us to hang on to this piece of property? Especially we do not own the entire property. Well, we own the piece that the health department and the health and the state rents from us. Okay, I don't know how you have a continuous strip mall and you only own part yeah, we, of it. We own... Okay, maybe it was con condos. Yeah, Lynn can explain that more. We only own okay, that. But then with yeah. that said, and that's just one off the top of my head, I don't know them all, and I thought we were going to get a list to the board of what we own. I can get that for you. Yeah. You want a list of all the buildings? The property yeah. that the county has vacant mm -hmm. in their intention, a list of the property, the buildings that we have that is utilized by county. Uh, mm -hmm. That's what I meant, property vacant. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we, and then we, also we the buildings that we have that are we're leasing out to other entities. I'd like to see this and see um, where we're at because I don't know, and right. I think that's an important thing. Let, we should let me know. back up, if I may, to <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Go ahead. <laughs> so backing up to the general fund, two things that I didn't mention. One, what you'll find. When you look at all the different divisions of the court, so the circuit court, juvenile court, probate court, district court probation, New Baltimore, uh, and uh, Romeo district courts, you'll see that there are some fairly large fluctuations in expenses between those divisions because the court is doing some reorganization. So you'll see a large decrease in the circuit court, primarily because of the MIDC fund, but they're also moving the reimbursement division into the juvenile court, they do most of the collection activity for the youth home. Uh, the district court probation department is basically being um, closed, and the probation officers are being moved and charged into the individual probate or district courts. Um, and there's something else, and I can't remember what. Hey, Steve. Yeah. Since you're talking about courts, can I ask you? And I know I know it came up in our meeting at one point, and I don't remember. Uh, if you said you guys were looking at it again or not, but our two district courts, it's been recommended a, a, a lot, of, a, a, I think, by the state scale uh, that they that they combine at some point because they're both we're we're funding both of them, and a lot of district courts in the in the communities are self funding. Is there is there more? I mean, if you guys, uh, when you just start talking about courts and reorganizing, I didn't know if that was part of no, it. No, no, we haven't looked at that. Okay. We have not looked at that in terms of you know combining the two. I know it's well, been discussed. Yeah, in and prior I years, but it I, I know it's been dis discussed yeah. a lot of times. I know that it's a you know a logistical probably nightmare for people right. in different the other communities, depending on which way you went. I just know that we had had a small discussion about it in our uh, our budget meetings, and we talked about it for with you, I think, a little bit to yeah um, to that tune. I didn't know if that was part of what you were looking for. No, 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 no. This is like moving. This is more moving people around between divisions. Okay. Well, and, and Mr. Chairman, to go back to what I'm asking, the assets, so I know, and, and that brought up the next part of my question was the courts, the district courts, the Romeo one. In two years, we're spending $300,000 for the building for a new Havoc system. The New Baltimore, another $100,000 in the next four years. You add this all up, and again, I, I'd like to see all this and then see what it's truly costing us for this and without knowing what we have and mm -hmm. I, I think it's important right. thank you thank you mr chairman <clears throat> thank you commissioner brown Budget doesn't cover that. 761 i think it's on page or slide number slide at the beginning i think it's the first 769 million yeah so the other thing i want to mention in the general fund is relative now that we're discussing majestic and uh, who's renting space from us and so on and so forth so we rent a significant amount of space to the state at the Verkulin building and at the majestic center in Warren those leases expire at the end of 2019 uh, we really don't expect them to renew their lease they're looking for more space and we don't have the space to provide so that's a loss of about 1.3 million dollars in revenue that's built into the forecast starting in 2020 just well, along the same line of questioning. I, d I don't have any other questions. Is that it for your presentation? It is. Fantastic. Seeing no questions, I need a motion to receive and file the 2019 Executive Recommended County Budget, 
uh, Commissioner Drolat, support by Commissioner Sauger. You're welcome. Please vote. Motion passes 12 to 0. Item 9, Finance Committee recommend, uh, recommendations. Uh, we have a motion to adopt them in their entirety. It's moved by Commissioner Romano, support by Commissioner Kraft. Any discussion on the, uh, the finance uh, motions to? All right, great. Please vote. A okay, motion passes 12 to 0. Item 10, ordinance. Motion, I need a motion to adopt the 2018 Macomb County Employees Retirement System Ordinance. Moved by Commissioner Toko, supported by Commissioner Lucido. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none, please vote. because uh, Mr. Keyes is not here. Sorry. <laughs> uh, all right, motion passes 12 to 0. Uh, item 11, new business. Any commissioners have any new business? Uh, oh, Commissioner Sauger. Not yet. Then we go to a private, get a private attorney, bring them in, and if we're, and I want to know how we pay for this because the last full board meeting we had here, we had that special counsel sitting here, and we paid him I don't know how many dollars an hour to sit and look at us. None of us asked him a question. Nothing was directed to him. So, I, I think that's got to be looked into, and I'm curious, and uh, I'd like to make a little explanation about it. Great. I can give you a little explanation. Anything that has to do with any conflict between us and the executive's office, the corporation council uh, automatically backs their, themselves out of it. So any other issue that we have that deals with anything besides any conflict with the executive's office, we go to corporation council on those things. Our, our independent council, which we've had for the seven years that we've been here, pay, is paid out of contract services and they're paid uh, hourly, there's no contract for how much that they work, and we have a contract services budget that we've been doing this with for eight years. And any other questions that you have on that, you can ask or go see uh, Patty's that you know has all the budgeting stuff down like that. But, but what, how much do they get when they're sitting here? With, with how much do they get an hour? Generally speaking, well, uh, Marv, I don't have that off the top of my head. It's whatever we approved for our corporate count or our independent council when we approve that at the beginning of the year. So you can check that out. Um, there are plenty of times that Scott Smith and our councils have been here for questions on different uh, items that we've never really had a question about. But there are times when we're dealing with topics that are legal topics that we anticipate questions on, and there's other items that they're working on here, so they're here already, whether it's our ethics policy or uh, different policies that we, that we look to them for guidance for. I'd like a sheet of paper to show me that, what, what he's getting, you what they're getting. Marv, like it's, it's all open. You can get anything. Anybody can uh, get all the, the numbers the that he wants. the other thing is, since we have them, and I know I've talked, a lot of attorneys have called me, how do they get uh, things? They like to represent. They like to give their input 
on different things in the county. Marv, it, it's been out to bid and it's been voted on by this board on who our council is on, on several occasions since I've been here. So it, it does I'm, go I'm out. On a, I'm, I know I'm getting older, but I'm trying to recollect <laughs> when the hell they were. All right. Ain't we'll give you all the information me. you need, Marv. Chair. I, I yes, I had another new business over there with Commissioner Kleinfeld. Okay, thank you, Chair. Well, um, first of all, um, I'm never opposed to taking that out to bid. I always wanted to try to get a Macomb County firm. So um, uh, I don't know how long it's been, but I agree that it's been at least twice since I came on that we took that out to bid. So we could take a look at that. And second, um, we have Clerk Smith here again. And, you know, since we changed the way that we do this, I don't know that she necessarily has to be here. I really appreciate it. it. I think this one was a really long one for you to sit through. Um, uh, and I, I don't think it's necessarily necessary that she come. And if she's just doing it on her own, wow, that's really nice of you because we don't have any other countywides that are coming uh, to these meetings. So thank you. Thank you. Uh, new business? Yes. Commissioner Romano. I just want to. Uh, I was listening to what Mr. Commissioner Sager mentioned. Incidentally, before I forget, that is painful. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, at least we have an idea of what's going on. We have something in front of us that we can follow along. This poor lady sits there. Yeah, I'm so <clears throat> Okay, it's just, it's, it's just painful, and I, we appreciate it. She has things running here. so well over there. Yeah, so b going back to what Mr. Uh, Commissioner Sager said, um, and Ms. Kleinfeld, I'd, I'd like to know also what kind of money we're paying this, and if, and if the county uh, council can't give us the answer, uh, then I would think we'd go to our independent council, but just to have, uh, and I think Mr. Sager summed it up by saying, just having him sit here and paying him, and we don't have any questions for him, and if we do, I'm sure we can give him to the chair ahead of time and then have him here, in lieu of having him here and just spend the money. I, I, so I, I, I can understand where Mr. Sager's coming right. from. So this is a board of 13. Anybody that wants to do something about the way that I run this community, this our core, our independent council, because I squeeze him for every dime that I get. They don't charge yeah. us for for travel time. He was here working. He said, "I'm here. I'm going to work right here. If you need me, he's done that many times." I squeeze these guys for every dollar that we can to get our service out of them from people that have been working for us and with us for eight years now. Um, you can get sure. You, you can always get that. You can always talk to Patty. She has the numbers up to the to the day, so you can always question these. We can always talk about going out for bid if we're if we want a new company, if we want a new person. Um, but that being said, we we do not have an independent or a, a corporation council of our own, and we know that our corporation council will deal with us on a lot of matters, and we'd go to him for every matter that we can. But there's more often than not, our, our issues are that we need a, a, a counsel for have to do with questions between us and the executive office, and he refuses, and rightfully so, he gets caught in the middle of this, to give us that type of advice. So uh, we, we are, I mean, we can do whatever we want here, and when we're directed, when I'm directed to do something by a majority of the members, we'll do anything, but the numbers are always available. This is government, and we are, our number one concern is transparency. They are there for the for the uh, everybody to see all the time. Any other new business? Great, public participation. Any members of the public wishing to speak? Oh. Any members of the public wishing to speak? Third and final time, seeing no members of the public wishing to speak, we're going to close public participation. Need a motion to adjourn, Commissioner Drolat, supported by Cl Commissioner Leonetti. Please vote. Yeah, I figured you were waiting for public participation to put, to put up with this.